There we go. Welcome everyone to the July 12th Utilities Community Meeting. Now we're gonna jump right into the Foster Pilot Project update. Oh, uh, very quickly. So Jackie, I hate to do this to you, but I think you're gonna have to do the minutes for this meeting. What? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. All right, well, I'll look at the last ones. And oh, let me get a piece of paper. I was not prepared. Hold on. Okay. All yeah, right. I can, I'll forward you. I'll send you right now the minutes from the last meeting. Okay. Even though they're on the S drive, but I'll send them to you. Okay. And All they'll right. be they'll be the recording also. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Just trying to record who's here. So we're yeah, I know. Oh, I know. Checking. Okay. <clears throat> So um, for the foster pilot project update, um, I wanted to go over the three um, parts of foster that we needed to look at. We need to look at in kind in time and place, um, which we know we're not gonna be able to do because of the streams that are impacted. Um, the streams that are impacted are Minter, Burley, um, Owala Creek, Purdy Creek, Blackjack, of course, is in our system, um, Gorse Creek, and a lot of those are outside of our system. So we knew that we had in that from the outset that we had to go outside of that. So then we, um, to, from Robinson Noble, had a subcontractor that did a water rights search um, for us. And this was what I included in the packets was the, was the kind of the, the outcome of that. After screening water rights in our area, we came up with 13 candidates and um, by using the county parcels, um, it did away with another five of them. So uh, this was kind of the final candidate screening and this is the screening and this is the volume of water um, available. So there's really one that they're very interested in that's in the, at the headwater, near the headwaters of the Blackjack Creek. And they are looking at that um, to see if they're sending out letters now to see if owners of those properties, because the original property that had the water right has been divided up, the owners are interested in diver, di divesting themselves of the water rights. So we're going down that path. Then uh, the next step is to, the, you know, developing the letter and contacting the current landowners. Then I wanted to bring this to your attention. This is, if we go back to the agenda, um, this is the mitigation portion, the augmentate, or I'm sorry, the augmentation portion and partly mitigation portion. Um, what this is, is they've identified, and this was um, something that was identified actually by one of the tribes suggested that we look at this. This is where the Port Orchard Airport is, okay? Um, out off of, I think it's Glenwood Road or Sydney out there where the Port Orchard Airport is. And it would divert stormwater runoff from impervious surfaces that are currently not being taken care of into a holding pond and then and then tr basically treat it and let it infiltrate. Oh, here comes some air. Let it infiltrate back into the water, um, the water table. So this, um, they have not yet figured out exactly what credit it would be, but because it's such a large area, they're thinking that it's gonna be quite a bit of credit that we're gonna need. Um, they are also looking at um, two projects that Pierce County had identified. Um, one is a fish passage and one is a channel project. And there may be um, uh, grant money that Pierce County is currently applying for, and those would um, benefit Minter and Burley Creeks out that are out in Pierce County. They're also looking at a restoration project. It's an idea only right now for um, Olala Creek. And then, um, yeah, then the, the, this is called a managed aquifer recharge is what this, or MAG, or MAR, that's what this project is called. So I just wanted to kind of give you an update that we're actually doing more than just modeling things. We're actually out in the field trying to get some some boots on the ground and some some um, things happening that are are quantifiable and qu and quality um, work that the Indian tribes can then look at to see if they're going to um, be in agreement with with our plan going forward. And this, of course, is on top of the augmentation stations that we have already identified that we're going to need to do through West Sound Utility District and the City of Bremerton. 
Um, so were there any questions about that? I know it's, it's a really complicated issue and I'm trying to <laughs> boil it down, so. So this, this whole foster pilot project has, is so involved. Yes. And yes. I guess I, their, their acceptance of our usage that we've requested is going to somewhat be dependent upon augmentation water going back into the system that's part of the whole big picture and this is what we're looking at that has this stormwater infiltration plays a role in that well um actually it's kind of um the legislation that the joint legislative task force is um looking at okay that the legislation that happened that created the joint legislative task force gives us three options um to put water back in the stream, water for water, right. to retire other water rights and stop them potentially making a draw on the aquifer or to um, mitigate for any problem, any um, impacts to in-stream flow. And the problem with mitigation, mitigating impacts to in-stream flow is the tribes don't agree with it. Uh, oh. And they don't agree with the legislation. So what we're trying to do is find projects that they themselves think would be beneficial so that they will support us. That's the way Sumner, it was another one of the fosters has been able to work with the Puyallup tribe, the Puyallup and Muckleshoots over there and the, the tribes are supporting them. They're just waiting for their model to be done. So what we're trying to do is find projects that the tribes themselves support so that they will support our overall plan. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jackie, I don't wanna oversimplify this, but back in the water for water days, even the tribes themselves here in the last 10 years or so recognized the fact that just putting water into a stream from a well wasn't benefiting the stream or the environment. And that kind of opened the door for this, uh, you know, different type of mitigation strategy rather than the end time in kind strategy. So, um, you know, even the tribes themselves recognize that what had been done historically wasn't really doing anything for the environment. The way I understand it, Mark, that's partially true. I don't think you can lump the tribes together like that because we're getting a different story out of the Squaxin Island tribe than we are Suquamish. Squaxin Island understands that concept wholeheartedly and is, and is very supportive of this kind of project and that's who turned us on to this one. But the Suquamish are still sticking to the water for water so far. Very complicated. <laughs> yes, yes. So you know, I have a question, Jackie. Water for water, is that then back to putting water into the streams equal to what we want to take out? And not equal to what we want to take out, John. The way it works is that through the hydraulic groundwater model, we show, because we're pumping from, like for instance, at well 13, we're 2,000 feet down. And right. so when we pump, we might impact a stream by half an acre foot per year. So that's the water we would have to put in, not all the acre feet that we take out of the well, but what we impact the stream by. The local stream. Correct. And do they have specific requirements on the water? I mean, I'm thinking about the uh, effluent that comes out of the treatment plant, is that adequate to be used for stream augmentation? We can use um, tertiary treated water, which is what that is, or the reclaimed water. The problem with the reclaimed water from our particular plant is we have no place to put it because nobody wants it. Um, and we would have to pipe it. The, what we, what um, our consultants have identified is that we would basically have to pipe it and pump it all the way down to Howell Farm to put it in the headwaters of the Salmonberry Creek. Is that one of the creeks that would be impacted then by us drawing is, water? Actually, Salmonberry Creek is one of the creeks impacted, as is Long Lake itself, as is Curly Creek, which is the outflow from Long Lake. From uh, Long Lake, and ecology has so far said that if we augment Salmonberry by the amount for all three of those that counts because it's flowing through Long Lake and then to Curly Creek. 
And as, as a reminder, there's, there is a, well, let's say purple pipe from the treatment plant up to, I believe it's Veterans Park, isn't it, John? Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's a pipeline that's a third of the way there, quarter of the way. So that may be someday in the future, a viable continuation potentially. Right, and it's certainly on, on the consultant's radar. They're looking at that. Okay. Wow. So we're still looking quite a ways off into the future then before we can really move forward with what the plans had been for well 13, the volume uh, and yeah, not necessarily. What we're trying to do is get our um, report of examination, which is what ecology requires in order for them to actually review and approve or deny water rights. So we're hoping to have that report of examination into them by the end of this year. We're just tying up all these loose ends, figuring out exactly what projects. But then that isn't the engineering for the projects. That's the concept of the project. And then when ecology says yay or nay, then we go down the planning steps of actually doing the project. But if they say yes, then we can move ahead with, with water rights and we'll just, the water right will be contingent on building the facility. The date I have in mind is before Jackie retires. <laughs> okay, can we, do we know that date? <laughs> One of the questions in regards to just, you know, volume wise, how big of a pipe do we need to bury? Is this, a, is this something that can be handled in a six inch main or 24 inch main? Or can we buy a tank truck and haul it out every day? Um, no, I think what the, um, there's an engineering firm that's working on, because we have to have feasibility for each of these projects. So there's an engineering working on um, an engineer's estimate for, as, as, a, as an example, that, that reclaimed water project. And I believe they're looking at a six inch line right now um, to do the augmentation for all three of those water bodies. So that's 20, or six inch for 24 seven pumping? Uh, it wouldn't have to pump at that. It wouldn't have to pump completely full all the time. A, a, a reclaimed water line isn't like a potable water line in that it has to have positive pressure on it all the time. No. Is, is it something that, you know, if we bought a, a tractor trailer tank, whatever, we fill it up every day and take it out and dump it somewhere, is, would that be adequate or do we know yet? Um, well, I know because <clears throat> there may be some opportunity for that um, when we get into some of the smaller streams because we, they have what they call the shoulder seasons. There's the wet season, of course, in the winter time. There's the dry season where we know we need to augment and then there's the shoulder seasons. So in the dry season when we need to do the most augmentation, if we build a smaller facility to handle what is necessary during the shoulder seasons, then we could augment that augmentation, if you will, with a water truck. If, if it's, I mean, I, the numbers haven't been crunched yet, but that's a possibility. Well, I just, you know, I'm trying to come up with alternatives of digging sure. up the road, putting in a pipeline versus maybe we build a, a whatever, 100,000 gallon tank somewhere and we just truck water to it, fill it up and then dispense it out of the tank at the appropriate rate or something, I don't know. Just Let it trickle in, yeah, yeah. The, the big thing is the summer seasons. I mean, that's our consultants have laid out the, uh, the required augmentations by, um, by month because it changes from month to month, so. More to come then. Yes. You know, and those all sound like really logical solutions, but the, you know, we chlorinate our water and, you know, and treat it and, now it's potable water instead of water we could just discharge into a stream. So it's 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 complicated. <laughs> and that's that's well, why we, we have the consultants. We do, we yeah, we well do there we do have the, we do have two augmentation stations that we're currently operating, one for Ross Creek and one for Anderson. Mm -hmm. And so we have a design that we've been using that um, dechlorinates the water by running it through um, through the ground, basically through a sand filter and then through the ground before it gets to the stream. Are we using UV for disinfection down at the treatment plant instead of chlorine? At the so. sewer treatment plant? I have no idea. 
I, I think we converted it to UV treatment, but I, you know, I don't remember. Mark has a question. Jackie, the, the, the streams that are that we're discussing here, how how often are they being monitored? Is it a 24-7, 365 monitoring of these streams? It's not, it, excuse me, it's not a monitoring mark. It's a it's a numer it's a hydraulic model. Um, that knowing what the groundwater is there and from from some, I mean, I it's a it's a standing hydraulic model that USGS um, developed. And that's what we've been told by the Joint Legislative Task Force to use as a basis for our planning. And the tribes have signed off on this model. They all, they all agree with them. Yeah, the problem is that USGS themselves agree that they never didn't design the model to be used to this minutia. Um, it was designed as a as a like a weather forecasting thing, not as um, for water rights. But so far, the Joint Legislative Task Force has said, that's the only science we have, so that's the science we're going to use. There is a water group that I belong to through the Washington Water Utility Council and through um, the, the person who is the water purveyor representative on the Joint Legislative Task Force. He's the chair of both water groups there. And we are currently have a, a quite a group of people that are working to um, do pre a presentation to the Joint Legislative Task Force, which is tomorrow, by the way, to the Joint oh. Legislative Task Force on why we should not, if we're going to use that model, which admittedly is the only thing we have to use, then we can't mitigate or augment down to the last drop. There has to be a, a, um, a consideration for model error. And so far, that that's where we disagree with the tribes. The tribes want, a model error is a model error period to the last drop. And we're saying that you, it, that's not possible. And that's not using good science to um, support science. It's using junk science to support science, so. Wow. All right, anything further to add to that or we just keep marching along? Oh, well, there's so much more that I could, <laughs> I could go on about, but um, in the interest of brevity, you know, these things are all work, being worked out and they change from week to week, the, mm -hmm. you know, what's going on, so. Okay, well, I bet that the splash pad retrofit is gonna be an easier subject. Uh, well, <laughs> Mark, do uh -oh. you wanna talk about this one? Oh. He went away. Yeah, maybe he had to run down the hall. So no. the splash pad retrofit, oh, there we go, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm trying to click buttons. Sorry. It's, okay, it, it was literally was not letting me work. Um, okay, so the splash pad, we're still on track for what we ultimately wanted to do, which is to get through the summer and get this work done right after Labor Day. We did have, again, some additional unexpected issues getting this to add, but we currently do have two bids right now. We're reviewing uh, whether they're responsive or not, but we do have two contractors within $40,000 that we're gonna move ahead with one of them and get them immediately procuring, because it's still only July, get them doing that phase one, which is to procure all materials and then start the actual work in uh, September. The, the biggest issue is that, you know, the engineer's estimate that at one time was more like two after we did the value engineering is, you know, back up to six. So uh, it, you know, the good news is it's, you know, water proprietary funds. The bad news is that uh, I think the value engineering estimate that we got, uh, we were extremely pleased with it, but I don't know how real it actually was. So we are moving ahead. We're getting through the summer so far without any issues with, you know, keeping kids uh, sprayed upon with uh, the splash pad. We even moved up the 
from noon to six, we moved it up to 10 to six based on a number of requests. So we're on track. Uh, it's just going to cost us a little more. So Noah's going to have to dig a little deeper and maybe pull a few pennies with lint on it uh, to pay for it, but it'll get done. So you're saying $600,000 from about 200 and some thousand? Well, at one time it was 700 and we did the VE to get it down and then it was down to two to 300. So right now it's between five and the current bid. Why does it Jackie? 560? Uh, five five ninety. Five ninety. So and six hundred. And the next one up, and that, if that one gets thrown out, then it's uh, six thirty-two. Okay. So, anyway, it's that's been a bit of a frustrating project when we look at the fact that at one point McCormick Communities was just going to do the conversion, and we had an opinion that they couldn't do that. So, um, in general, a frustrating project. But we'll we'll get it done. Okay. Thank you. Uh, are we ready to move on to the storm drainage comprehensive plan? Uh, yeah. This was this is just to update you on where we're at with the first ever city of Port Orchard stormwater comprehensive plan. Um, so we're. We're working toward, you know, getting this done, and hope we've we've told the consultant that we want this um, in December, so that we can look at adopting it at the end of the year or the very first of 2023. So the one thing I do want to point out to this is, so if you remember, in about 2010, I think it was, we had our MPDS Phase Two permit, and we established the you know, the, 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 the monthly payment, you know, based on impervious surface units, based on that study, you know, but that wasn't a storm comprehensive plan with actual capital improvement project. So this is an actual, just like our water and sewer and transportation, this is a storm comprehensive plan. And the one thing that the council, the to me, there's two, legislative actions that need to be really looked at in the future. One is obviously adopting this plan with its associated capital improvement plan. The other one is a fairly, I'll say it's a fairly new concept, which are uh, capital facility charges, um, mm -hmm. like we have for water and sewer development, paying for development. Uh, a component of this comprehensive plan is recommending CFCs. So I think that's probably the the one topic that will need to be discussed further at utility committee, finance committee, and ultimately at a work study to see if the city wants to uh, pursue capital facility charges. Mark, when would that be? In a couple uh, of months, do you think? That yeah, we would take I, it to work study? Yeah, I think they're looking at the, what was it June? Uh, they're talking about, my guess, I thought what I heard was it, when it was going to be August, September that we would actually be looking at conversations around, you know, finalizing this plan. Okay. So it could be August, uh, I but would, I know that... Wouldn't, I wouldn't, know that the, wouldn't the council want to adopt the plan so that we know that that, that we are have their support with the CIP program before we looked at the CFCs? Well, I think we've got to, again, our practice is always to have the council adopt after the I, college year health approved. Mark, I, yeah, I think this committee needs to see this plan in detail first, where yeah. there is no work study in August. Yeah. Uh, so I, hopefully, I don't know if committees are meeting in August or not. That's up to the committees. The plan, Rob, the plan won't be ready until November or December. Okay. Oh man! Okay. But you could start talking about the CIPs and the CIPs. Not without the plan, we're not. Okay. Well, it's going to be a little later, but I, I definitely, I would recommend having the CI, the plan with the CIPs and the CFC discussion before you, so that you have a, a plan that the city concurs with before you submit it to ecology. 
and then ultimately adopt it. Right, yes. The same process we took with the water plan. Yeah. Okay. It's just hard to see that getting done by the end of the year. Not if you're not gonna see it at a committee until December. Mm -hmm. And we don't have a work study in December. Well, I, I still think you can have conversations about whether you want or don't want CFCs. I don't think you can have that conversation in a vacuum. Yeah, well, again, if you have this, if the CIP list is, if you're looking at, because we did the water system plan in sections too. So if you have the, the CIPs, you know, if the cost of the CFCs were anticip anticipated, you could have those conversations knowing that the comprehensive plan has different sections that are outside of that conversation. But, but you, you know, I don't think there's a, a rush on, on this. I think Nick has the desire to have this incorporated into, you know, the 2023 comprehensive plan. I don't think it has to be done in the 2022 comprehensive plan. Yeah, I, I can just say that the deadline for amending or for incorporating the stormwater plan into the comp plan is going to be the end of January. Um, it seems to me that I think Mark is right, talking about the capital project list and the capital potential capital facility charge could occur in advance of seeing the entire draft, but it's a big enough document. I think you're going to want to see it and digest it in pieces anyway. Um, and November feels about right to start doing that work, maybe October, but probably November with a goal towards submitting that for inclusion into the comprehensive plan by January 31st of next year. So we should probably plan on getting it into the, onto the November work study agenda. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that this would, there would be, a, be enough meat on the bone, so to speak, to have conversations about CIPs and CFCs in October utility and finance. Hey, Mark. Yeah. Don't we have to have Ecology sign off on this uh, prior to bringing it to the city for approval? Yeah, that's historically, that's what we want is to okay. have a, but that doesn't mean that the city can't review the document and then either do a concurrent review like we did with the water system plan or have the city you know bless the plan that we have where we've talked about cips and cfcs and the, the plan in general and then we submit it to ecology then we ultimately they review it so that you're adopting an approved plan well, it's actually a case of which came first, the chicken or the egg, because yeah. ecology and health want it adopted by the council before they approve it. But if we do that, then they come back with comments and then we have to change it. And then you, we have to go through the adoption process a second time. So I kind of pre, I kind of fudge a little bit is the way I guess a good way to put it. So I, I would rather get the council to, you know, generally say we support this, then we submit it, tell ecology that, you know, council hasn't formally adopted this, but has reviewed it so that we can get their comments. Because yeah, we don't want to have to adopt it twice. And we've had to do that with other system plans and it's a bit of a pain. Right, exactly. Okay. Yeah, it sounds like preliminary discussions are, are in order, but not until, you know, end of October or November-ish. Right. Well, the sooner we can get it to a work study, the better. <laughs> so some kind of presentation coming up then, I, I think to get people thinking about this, that would be great. Okay. And you'll, again, because of August not having a work study and those agendas get pretty full. Okay, sounds good. Uh, Stetson Heights development. You want me to take this one, Mark? Okay, so uh, just real quickly, I just wanted to let you know um, that Stetson Heights development has been held up because they needed a water booster station. And basically, it's they, we told them this two years ago, and they didn't listen to us for quite a while. And by the time they went down that path to start um, 
uh, doing the engineering and design on one, um, they were already asking for, you know, some, some considerations. So we, I pushed through as fast as I could with Department of Health, who is way behind because of COVID on review times. And we finally got the approval for their plan. They're nearly built now. And we've been talking to them about how we might be able to actually get the testing done and the, dechlor the chlorination and dechlorination of the system um, so that they can get started as quickly as possible. So I just wanted to let you know in case you, you know, get questions from constituents or something about what's going on out there that we are, we're, we're very close to being able to energize that station, at least do the initial testing. Okay, so that would mean that um, perhaps they would be able to start making use of this in the next month or two? Yes. Okay, before the end of the year, before? Yes, before, absolutely before the end of the year, yes. Great, okay. Always something, huh? Yeah. And now um, the water rates discussion, is that where Katie comes in? Yes, and I don't know if Noah, Nick, or or uh, Mark wants to do an intro or just go right to Katie or. I think we just, uh, I think, does everybody know Katie Isaacson? I would just. John and Cindy, yes. Mark. Mark. Mark's new. Hi, yeah. Katie. Pleasure to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Uh, I have a presentation here, if uh, you all are good with that. Thank you. Uh -huh. You should be able to share. Oh, there we go. So uh, tonight we've been working on the water rate study. I'm assuming then no one from the city was giving an, an intro, so I'll just push right ahead. Um, we've been working with, I, I've been working with uh, utilities, public works, finance, uh, and DCD. And we've, had, that's our team, rate study team. And we've been going through and uh, updating the rate study, doing a financial outlook. We've been looking at the capital improvements program that was adopted in the comp plan. Uh, we want to make sure that we can afford those. Uh, we're looking at rate structure adjustments, and we have uh, recommended water rates for a five-year schedule. We are discussing, uh, are anticipating that they could be effective January 1st, 2023. And then we have next steps about going through the adoption process, meeting with finance committee and council work study next week. Uh, and then have dates for a water rate ordinance, first reading and second reading. And we can talk, we'll talk about that again at the end. Uh, I wanted to show you that I, I just got across my desk this week. Um, the American Water Works Association is the industry standard that we have. And they, every year they put together a survey of um, experts in the field. And they're looking at, at, they give a good summary of what's going on, what are the concerns, so forth. And uh, the number three top challenges this year are renewal and replacement of aging water infrastructure, financing of capital improvements, and long-term drinking water supply availability. And I want uh, to let you know that these are all prominent in uh, Port Orchard's mind and that we've been taking those account, uh, they've been taken into account as you did your water system plan. And now as we put together the water rate study and to make sure that we ha are thinking of this to, to carry you for generations into the future and to be sure that you can continue to provide safe, reliable, affordable uh, drinking water service. So the goals of our rate study are to make sure that we meet all of the water utility obligations. We look at operations, debt, capital improvements, and reserves. Uh, we wanna be sure that we can fund 
the recommended capital improvements that were adopted in the comp plan. And when I say CIP throughout this evening, I mean capital improvement plan. Um, we want to promote water conservation and to make sure that that's reflected in the bills that uh, customers are seeing. And we want to take more steps to increase the equity among the customers by adjusting the rate structure. So those are our goals coming into the uh, rate study. Now, the question is, how important is water revenue? And uh, on the left, you see the pie chart, water sales, so our water rates are 90%, 98% of the revenue coming into the water system. And we have to have a self-sufficient fund. We, all, all the water, uh, revenue that comes in stays for water utility operations or is saved in reserve for future capital improvements. So water rates are very important that, uh, because they're 98% of the revenue. And then when we look at how does that break down, currently 75% of the rates come from residential, 21 from commercial, and 4% from irrigation. So looking at the expenses out over the six years, um, you can see, I like the picture because it shows us very clearly what we're paying for with rates. And the biggest section of blue down below are the operating expenses. And then we have a slice of existing water debt. Then the green and the purple, the two on top, together, these are the CIP program. We know that we will have to borrow to carry out the CIP program. And when we, in the model, when I say we're gonna borrow, it estimates what those debt payments will be so that we can plan and have the money available to make those payments. So the green slice is the water um, capital improvements that we will pay as you go. You're gonna pay cash for. The purple slice is the portion that you're gonna have debt repayment. You're gonna have borrowed the money and rates are gonna make the debt repayment. And the difference between rates and capital facilities charges, we have looked at the projects and we have allocated them and we know how much rates should pay and how much should be coming from capital facilities charges. So all of that is in internal to the model, okay? And it's capital facilities are gonna pay the growth share, uh, the portion of that debt. So here's the capital improvements. Um, we are uh, looking and I differentiate the colors by funding source. So you can quickly see the ones that are in orange are the ones that are intended to be borrowed. Uh, the ones that are in purple are the ones that either the developer is providing or the CFCs will be paying for directly. And the ones that are in green are the ones that rates will pay as you go or, or come from reserves. Now, uh, again, I was saying that when we borrow, we uh, assign whether it will be coming from rates or whether it will be coming from new customers through their CFCs, capital facilities charges. Um, and just to call your attention down here on some of these ones that are green, as remember we heard repair and replacement, replacement of existing aging infrastructure and how important that is, that we have built that in. So we have um, some main replacements that are, because your hydraulic model said that you would be out of capacity. So we have main replacements in the program for that. We have annual main, main replacement funding and you have one to four inch mains that ultimately should be upsized to six to eight inch mains. So we have a budget every year to come and then that allows the city to prioritize what are the highest priorities and the first one to come for that is the Bay Street. So we're reworking um, using that annual main replacement and it's gonna go towards the Bay Street uh, water main replacement. Uh, we also have valve replacement and hydrant replacement. And all of these are budget items that the money's coming in rates and then the, the budget is available to go for the highest priority projects. Um, then the total 
CIP now, I know we had higher numbers before, but this is from 2022 to 2029 is 48.4. I think our original number was in the 50s, but that included 2021. So we're making some progress. So when we put it all together, um, here's kind of the, the summary of the outlook, what, what we're talking about. Um, and we'll talk more about how we're doing this, but currently the typical um, base rate is $81.50 for two months for a three quarter inch meter. Um, we're talking about restructuring so that the base rate can be lowered. And then after that, we will uh, increase it about $4 per month each year or about $2 per, sorry, $4 per two month bill or $2 per bill. Uh, and the model looks at your operating fund balance and to make sure that you have enough that you're meeting your cash flow reserve of three months and that you're meeting your uh, financial policies. And at the end of this uh, 2027, it has about 1.5 million that's, un that's available for other projects. Now, in our base model, well, because we're trying to be conservative, um, we know that there's potential, there's discussion for potential utility tax increase of 3%. We didn't know whether that would be happening or not. So it's in this base um, estimate. And uh, if, however, there was no change to the utility tax, the difference would be about 50 cents a month on the base rate, just to give you a sense of what that difference would be. And Katie, if I may, the, sure, the, please. Uh, that utility tax increases what I laid out at the retreat and we discussed for a road preservation program, we would uh, fund, fund a utility tax increase that would go to the general fund that council would potentially pass a resolution and dedicate those funds. And we, as, as we move this forward, we'll dust that piece back off and remind everybody. And it was proposing a roughly a, a million and a half dollars a year to go to street preservation and maintenance. And uh, in our best years, we've done a million dollars in street preservation and maintenance. So uh, there'll be more conversation about that too, but I just wanted to point that out and what, what the, the thought process of was there. Okay. So when we, let, let's talk about what we're uh, proposing with the residential rate structure. Um, right now you have two base rates. You have a low base rate for zero to 3000 gallons. That's really a discounted base rate. It's discounted 35%. Um, then you have your typical base rate or normal base rate. It includes up to 5,000 gallons in your first 5,000 gallons, and then you begin water after that. Currently, the low base rate is at 5,350, and the standard one is at 8,150. So that, that's quite a jump um, between those two. And that means that everyone else uh, is paying for 5,000 gallons. And our goal to promote conservation, uh, we thought it would be best to have one base rate and then every, including 3,000 gallons and everyone start paying after 3,000 gallons. This would make sure that uh, no customers are, pay, are, you know, have the same bill if they use 4,000 gallons, right? It, it will, their bills would vary. And in order to do this, what we're proposing over here is to have uh, the low base rate and we need to adjust it, right? Our $4 to meet the target we would eliminate this second base rate. So we have only one, uh, that's, that will be a reduced rate. They'll go from 8150 to 5750 for those customers. Uh, everyone would start paying for water at um, 3000 gallons. The rest of these tiers would remain the same. Now we know that we're losing revenue of the base rate by doing this. And we, we need to make up that revenue, right? We need to um, make up for it. And the way we're doing that is starting charge at 3000 gallons, but also these rates are higher. So 
uh, the dynamic and we're, we're testing and retesting and um, making sure that we're, we're taking everything into account so that some customers would be going down and other customers would be going high. But the result would be um, the customer bills would vary with your usage. And if you use more, you pay more. So we also have put together our five-year rates for residential. So um, this is scenario F, by the way. As you can imagine, we looked at a number of them. And some of them that we looked at didn't meet our target revenue, so they, are, were, they came off the table. So um, the scenario F was the preferred one from the rate study team. And that was the one I just described. So our um, base rate would be 5750. And then we have our consumption tiers uh, that goes up. And then as we go, so we have restructuring in 2023. And then after that, what we're, we're just passing on what that increase needs to be to make us there. And it's relative down here to stay with our same dynamic. Um, this way, we're better reflecting the homeowner's uh, conservation efforts, which we think is good, and uh, giving incentive to conserve. So let's look at what this would mean as an impact on our sample customers. So we have our low use customer that's at right at 3000. Um, right now they're at 5350. They unfortunately would be paying more because we need to make up um, that that's what the increase would have had to have been uh, before we do our restructuring. And so that would be $4 for two months or $2 per month would be the increase. Our typical residents on a year round average, it uses 7,000 gallons. So they would be going from $89 down to $76. That's a $12.85 decrease for two months or about a 650 decrease for one month. Um, then we're making up for that by the other ones are gonna be paying more in their um, as they use more. So a summer residence that uses 20,000 gallons, they'll be paying just a little bit more at $1.49 for two months. But and when you get up to 30,000 gallons, there's your $13. There, there's where you make up for that. And everyone who uses over 30,000 gallons, that will continue to step up. So I, that we, what we have here is um, we're, we're based on a scale. Um, its numbers are uh, relative to one another, and that scale uh, continues out for the five years. So how, does, how do you compare to your local jurisdictions? As a first, a reminder that every system has to uh, be self-sufficient. They all have different sources, different contracts, different customers, and all need to be self-sufficient. But given that, we have known that Port Orchard has been more expensive uh, than the other customers. And the goal back when we did the uh, gap analysis on our five years there was to be able to take steps to become bring in more equity. And because you've done so well at that, we are now able to take this next step to try to bring down that base rate uh, and make it up for it on the uh, water usage side. So under this proposal uh, from 88.80, the proposed would go to that seventh customer using 7,000 gallons would be at 75.95, uh, including 3,000 gallons. Um, that's still higher than the rest, but more in line. Uh, the other thing that just for your background, um, the other jurisdictions start charging water at zero. Um, we thought while that would be great to do, we thought uh, it was best to take smaller steps to get there and to go to one base rate at 3000 gallons um, made the most sense to stay here. Uh, and then I've converted all of their rate structures to a per 1000 gallons. The rest of them actually charge per 100 cubic feet, but you're at gallons, you're 
customers are used to that. The billing system works off that. Your meters work off it. So um, we're, we're saying stay the same. And you can see the range. Uh, everybody has a different dynamic in how they set their base rates and therefore and how they set their um, tiered rates and how many tiers they have and what that differential is. So you're not at the highest. Um, you are the only one that includes uh, some in the base, but you're not the highest either. So uh, it fits right right in there. Uh, then on the non-residential -re side, we also took a look at the non-residential side and wanted to make sure that we uh, were to see if there were uh, steps that we could take to improve the equity. And right now, your category is called the multifamily and larger meters. But what we're proposing is that the multifamily residential would still work as a residential. Right now, it works as a residential. You get a base rate per dwelling unit, and um, you get a meter differential, and then um, you get 3,000 gallons per unit. So the billing system accommodates this. We're saying continue that, um, keep it under residential. And then for non-residential, we're talking about there's commercial, government, irrigation, uh, and other non-residential accounts. You have a category called church. Um, and here we would do base rate by meter size. So uh, in a way you have that now, and we would include the same 3000 gallons per meter. Now, the difference is uh, right now you pay a base rate and then you have a meter differential. I mean, everybody pays the 8150 base rate and then there's some meter differential. I'm not sure what basis that was originally put together, but it, it does not meet AWWA industry standards. We tried to bring some uh, steps into it the last time, uh, but we certainly did not get there all the way. And it seems like now is the time to go to this industry standard and simplify. Part of it also is you have a new modern billing system, which you did not have back then. And um, this billing system we know will accommodate this much more typical. And I'll show you uh, that in a minute. And then we'll have uh, the water usage rates would be stay the same as residential. That's what you have now. Some of these other jurisdictions have residential water usage tiers and rates, multifamily tiers and rates, and commercial tiers and rates. You are used to having one for all of your customers. I see no, no reason to change. So we just uh, keep all the water, uh, whatever those tiers and rates are, they apply to all of your customers. So here's what we're talking about for the non-residential then. Um, we have our meter sizes. We have three quarter inch, one inch, one and a half, so forth. Our largest meter that we have is six inches. By the way, in your, your code goes to 10 inches, but you don't have anything larger than a six inch. So if we use AWWA factors, then we could simplify the code and show that it goes to six inches and say if there's any larger to talk to the public works director or you know a, a specific person and use AWWA factors. So there's that possibility. Um, so what they do is look at the meters and they say a three quarter inch meter is your typical residential. And then all the larger meter sizes are compared to that. And we have a meter equivalency factor. So a one inch meter is 1.67 times a three quarter inch meter. A one and a half inch meter is 3.33 times and so forth. Um, these, again, are steeper than what you had before. And when I add your base rate and differentials, you're in this column at 8150 for a three quarter inch meter. And let's say a one inch meter is 8750. So under the new proposal, the three quarter inch meter would be 5750. So they would be getting a decrease and a one inch meter would be at $96. So they would have an increase of eight dollars um, per, and then it would go up from there. So we took a look at um, 
the finance has been working on the doing an analysis of the actual customers and looking at who's in there and who's going to shift and we do we have detailed information on that that we're it's hot off the press today so we're you know dotting our i's and crossing our t's and making sure that uh it will be working the other difference that we are um doing in this is it used to be if you were a commercial customer and you had a various units you would pay your your differential which was slower and you would pay uh, by the number of units so the mall i think has 90 some units and their base rate was you know 90 times the uh 8150 and they would have an allowance of you know 90 times 5000 gallons right it used to be in the in the usage and they would pay for over that they were not using that level of water um so they were this would result in a decrease and again the impact on every individual customer will depend on their usage and can change from month to month hey, um hey, yes question you know, please you, you and noah i know you guys were working on this late this afternoon yes do you have a rough idea how many six inch meters we have out there in the city is it 500 or one 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 one, one. um there, there's actually two six inch meters one is a um, large multifamily, so that will go be spun off into the multifamily, and one is the jail. Oh, okay, all right. I just, you know, I wasn't. If it was a hundred businesses, we were going to be reaching out to. No, and four them. inches uh, off the top of my head, I want to say there was a couple, three inches, maybe a handful uh six or eight something like that the the list i saw was both multifamily and and we're going to split those so I, we haven't count i i haven't counted uh the specifics of that the a bulk of them again are as we would expect are three in the three quarter inch meter and there's more uh as you step up the tiers or the meter size there's fewer and fewer now Keep you know uh, you know, a business like uh, a box store is going to have a large pipe, but it's for the fire hydrants in the, in the fire suppression system. That doesn't get counted in this equation because it'd be their water, their potable water is what we're charging them for. Uh, if, I, if I can interject there, uh, Mayor, those generally don't have a meter. What they have is a detector check. So it's mm -hmm. a check valve that has a detector on it that we check once a year to see if there's been any usage. Yeah, okay. Katie, where do schools fall in, into this? Uh, typically schools are around a three inch meter. There may be some smaller ones. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know the specifics of all the schools just because it was so hot. But these questions that you're asking, Noah and I are taking notes and we'll be you know, look, looking at that so we can bring forward an specific answers. Yeah, and, and Katie's correct. Uh, it looks like most of the schools are at the three inch meter. And uh, to answer the mayor's question, it looks like 70% of the accounts are one inch or smaller. So they fall in that three quarter to one inch. Uh, mm -hmm. As Katie said, you only have a one, one account that's a six meter, two accounts that are four, and then 11 accounts that are three meters. So basically anything over a three quarter inch meter, there will be two increases because the uh, usage is is coming down from 5,000 to 3,000, and then there will be the increased rate. So uh, depending on their usage, they may look at it like there's two increases. Well, the three, the three quarter inch, their rate's going down. But I know, I know, but I'm talking about that. Business so yeah, I, I think that's um, important to, that, that we've looked at the numbers and thought about that. And really what's happening is the 8150 for including 5,000 gallons uh -huh. was not a good deal for the customers. Right. And this mm -hmm. moving to the 5750 mm -hmm. is a much better deal for the customers. So they're going to reduce, just like the um, residential customers we saw mm -hmm. when they, 
the three quarter inch meter is going to pay less on the base rate. Right. And the amount they pay between three and 5,000 gallons is not going to make up that difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if they're using just the small amount and uh, there are um, typically in a city, there's um, a good section of the businesses are small mm -hmm. and don't use very much. I, those are the customers that will see a decrease. Sure. Um, have you accounted for the fact that if everyone went real crazy with conservation, um, we would still be okay? Um, is some that may happen? We quit buying water from Bremerton for a while. Well, there you go. That would help right away. Well, I'm just wondering. I mean, if that would make an impact, if people really went crazy with conserving. Um, that's always an issue when we are shifting, the, the way I look at it is we're shifting revenue from the fixed portion of the base rate and we're moving it over to the variable portion. Mm -hmm. So yes, th there is always a risk of that. Um, we've tried to be conservative, reasonably conservative in our assumptions. For example, the amount of, of water that we used uh, we had a 12 month window and we, there were some known leaks. So we removed that. And when I look at the amount of water that I was using to test this, uh, it's 95% of what you actually had for 2021. Mm -hmm. So we thought that was reasonably conservative. Mm -hmm. And if everyone went totally crazy you have your rate stabilization fund that has been funded, that's sitting there. That's your emergency on that. Um, we do like the idea of the council, again, having a five-year rate uh, in the ordinance and in code so that everyone knows what to expect coming up mm -hmm. and that there's some stability in that, both for the customers and the utility. But if you found that uh, everyone did conserve uh, too much, more than one year, then you, you would have to review and maybe make adjustment. But we don't wanna go any longer than five years because that's just, that's, that we feel is the longest reasonable time to include. Hey Katie, I have a question and, and maybe Noah, you can chime in on this as well. In the, in the examples you gave us for the other water districts around our area, um, you mentioned uh, Port Orchard's the only one that includes a base rate of, of water. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Why are we trying to be different than everybody else when it seems like the norm is a zero meter charge and then you pay for every gallon of water you, you use individually? Why are we going with a 3,000 gallon base rate? Jack can tackle that. It's just what we've always done, Mark. And we're moving away from that by ratcheting it back. But the, the conversation internally was to not go wholesale away from what we've historically done. Yeah, if I could chime in real quick, we we that was that was what I was advocating for, Mark, because that is kind of the industry standard. Um, 20, 30 years ago, the industry standard was to allow water usage in a base rate. Um, and as conservation got more and more ramped up in the industry, it went away. But when we looked at the actual numbers, it was too big of a jump, too big of a bite. That's why we're taking baby steps to get there. All right, thank you. I have a question. Is it possible, Noah uh, or Katie to I think it would be helpful for me at least to understand how this burden is getting shifted around within each of the categories and then in relationship to each other. So are we going to have 30% or 20% of our current residential units be a decrease and 40% seeing an increase or and then are we going to see relative to each other? Are residents going to see uh, an X percentage change over multifamily over commercial, just so we can see how this proposal was going to affect the different categories as well as within those categories. Now, I asked a similar question this afternoon, John. So you it's on, it's on, it's on radar. 
Okay. Yeah, Noah, I, I didn't know if you wanted to chime in, but th that is the analysis that we're trying to work on. Uh, before tonight's meeting, we wanted to be sure we had re we were reasonably comfortable with uh, the analysis, and then it's we'll we'll put this put the summary together to help you. Well, personally, I'm fine with what you presented, but before I can sign off, I'd like to see how it's going to impact you know, all of the users within the system. So I think, you know, the next piece would be to have that broken down so we can see how it's gonna impact everyone. Great. And I know uh, Noah has it on the commercial side and we were discussing about try, out of the billing system, which, right, we have the most confidence when it comes out of the billing system because we are shifting what's going on um, and whether to do that on the residential side as well. And then I guess just in a general question, if you could just put it in perspective, you know, Mark raises an awfully good question and I appreciate having this dramatic shift of this is the way we've always done it, but what would it mean if we just went to a per gallon rate period in the subject? How would that shift things around? It was more dramatic. The rate, the rate shift. I think what happens is the lowest customers have to pay more okay. and the higher customers, the higher usage customers pay more. Um, and that, that, uh, that, that's the part that that's, you know, more challenging is, um, the, these lower ones would end up paying more and we didn't want it to uh, be, be too much. And what we don't get from that, everyone else ends up paying as well. Well, I kind of thinking that that would be the case when you mentioned that a box store might have a, a six inch meter, but only use a small amount over the year. So if we went to a, just a flat gallon usage, they would get by much lower than what they're paying today. So makes sense. And, and the non-residential, the AWWA meter factor. So this is really, um, the concept is, this is the demand they're placing on the system right. by having those larger meters. And yep. so they're paying that in the base rate. They're paying their allocation of that in the base rate. And then they pay for the water they use. Makes and that, that puts them uh, equal, you know, with the residential customers. And we're, re we're able, by doing this, we're able to reduce the bur burden on those smaller meter size. That's because we're sharing more with the larger. Hey, Katie, one more question. Um, mm -hmm. So we've got, we've got uh, non-residents and we've got resident, residential, um, and they've got a packaged amount of, of usage into each bill when they use an additional 756 gallons, are they gonna get billed that for just that additional 756 gallons or are they gonna be rounded up to a thousand? How will that work? That's a really good question. And um, we were discussing that with the billing system. While your rates are um, specified at a rate per 1000, the bill is actually prepared for the uh, meter reading. And uh, it depends on whether it comes to a gallon or tens of gallons or hundreds of gallons, depends on the actual meter that's at that site. Yeah, and Mark, a, a great example is um, in our current structure where we have the two base rates, uh, a residential customer would pay uh, the 5350 now and they would receive up to 3000 gallons of water under that rate. Uh, if the meter reading comes back at 3,100, they immediately tip into 8,150. Okay, it just immediately tips into that next tier. And so this is where the, really the equity of going to straight consumption, straight meter reading uh, you know, is really demonstrated because then they would pay not 8,150, but they're actually 450 per thousand gallons for that additional 100 gallons of water that they use rather than an additional 2,000 gallons, which they did not use. Mm -hmm. um, 
So we do do it based on the meter and we do it um, per rate based on the rates itself. So it is, it is a rounding factor then is what you're saying, Noah. Well, no, under our current structure, in our current structure, uh, we do the meter reading, but the second they tip into that next tier, because it's a base rate for any consumption between 3,000 to 5,000, that's what they pay. And so a lot of the, you know, uh, customers that come to the front desk are, are upset that they're paying this higher dollar amount um, when they feel like they should pay, you know, $55 because they just paid barely one gallon over that 3,000 mark. Mm -hmm. Now going forward, you'll still have that base at the 5750, but anything beyond 3,000, you're now prorating it based on actual consumption. I think this is going to actually go over quite well. Um, it does seem very fair. The this one, only, some of the people have been asking for, quite a few people were asking for actual usage payments. Just watching time here. We got to make some I was just going to say, Madam Chair, we've got the. Uh, yes, we do have another meeting. To wrap things up and drive down to City Hall. So. Yes. All right. Sounds good. The, the last is just to um, show you the, the dates and, and what the plan is, uh, as I understand it for going through with the council. Yeah, and we'll take all the feedback we heard tonight and try to uh, again add more to the presentation, uh, provide more data, graphs uh, to help you guys make an informed decision. Thank you. Thank you, sounds good. Thank you everyone, this was extremely interesting. All right, see you in a bit, huh?